And now we have our final talk of the day. And our speaker is Charles Lindsay. And his talk is titled, Beijing Statistics with Python, No Resampling Necessary. See it now. Excellent. Right. There we go. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you all very much for coming. I'm Charles Lindsay. I'm a principal data scientist at Revionics, a division of Aptos. And uh, today I'm going to talk about how you can do Bayesian statistics in Python. Uh, without computationally intensive resampling, uh, particularly my package Bayes Mapbar. Okay, so, <clears throat> in the beginning, you have data, and you know you collect it, you know, organize it, all your data cleaning, munging, whatever you want to call it, uh, and then you have to decide how you want to do your analysis. How do you want to answer questions from your data? So. Particularly in modern times, there are a lot of really powerful black box methods uh, that get you really great predictions, but the model they're using to get those predictions can be very hard to interpret. You know, you could have lots of parameters and looking at any individual one is kind of meaningless. Uh, this can unfortunately also lead to misapplication of these methods as well. Uh, because the analysts that are using the model don't understand the model and are misapplying it. Uh, and, you know, so for predicting for future data outside your training, uh, you, you might misapply it and get uh, bad uh, forecast accuracy in that, you know, in the truth that you care about. So, in answer to that, you know, we have parametric models. Uh, that can have an easily interpreted structure. And they're based on statistical principles uh, that get us predictions and parameter estimates and that we can interpret in terms of probabilities. Uh, some black box methods only provide point estimates, not even a confidence interval, not even a standard error. So <clears throat> Bayesian takes that parametric uh, framework and does some extra stuff to it. Um, in contrast to Bayesian, which I'm about to define, you have frequentist methods. And they see parameters as just fixed values. You get your new data and you re-estimate the parameters. You're ignoring the past and you're ignoring whatever domain expertise you actually had too. Bayesian analysis can, can incorporate that past knowledge and that domain expertise into a prior. The prior density is our model for that, you know, early prior belief in the particular parameters of the model we're estimating. And this is done before any uh, data is observed. Now, you might have fit models previously to old data, but the data you're analyzing now, uh, you're just, you know, taking things fresh with whatever you folded into that prior density. And let's define a little bit more what that what we mean by that. Um, so, you know, in the kind of the modeling that we've done, you know, we might believe that an elasticity should be centered below one for products with static demand in the past. So we might kind of center it below there. And, you know, if you're uh, analyzing some temperature data, uh, you might think, okay. If I'm in the desert, I'm gonna have more variation than if I'm on the coast, just in the data you've seen in the past and so forth. So when you're estimating stuff for, you know, yeah, a new parameter for temperature, like the mean temperature, you're gonna to wanna to consider that uh, as you do your analysis. And, you know, more generally, some parameters might, you know, you might just constrain them to be positive. And others, you'd say, okay, they can be anything. 
accounts, you know, uh, all, all, you know, th there's lots of examples of things you want to be, you know, okay, it's positive, okay, it's negative, et cetera. And beyond just location, there's kind of a level of confidence you can have in a certain, in a parameter. Um, you might, this, this is an example that you might apply to, you know, uh, different real world cases, but you might think that, you know, I have a really good idea of the variation here with this blue one that's going to be small. But the uh, red case, say the desert, uh, with the wide variation, you would think, okay, that would be large. And so you can kind of see, like, you know, when you're observing new data, you would think, like, the one from the blue population, whatever your current new data is going to be, you're going to think, okay, that's going to be more tightly, uh, tightly packed around the center than the red. Uh, so that's kind of the general, you know, attributes that you can get from, uh, you know, taking your priors into account. And also, uh, using this Bayesian modeling framework, that also gives you regularization, which is important, you know, whether you have a black box model or parametric model, whatever. Uh, it helps you, you know, prevent overfitting. And with Bayesian, you have the advantage that the regularization is very easily interpretable. It's all from that prior density, that prior belief that you have. Uh, so your domain expertise is helping you get regularization. Uh, you know, and there are other forms of regularization too that, you know, they're intuitive, but they're based on just kind of gross aggregate things like, okay, I want my parameters to not be big. I want to shrink them and stuff. Here we're saying, okay, maybe I don't want my parameters to be big, but I've got a good reason why I believe they aren't. So, so that's kind of the, this, uh, the framework for progress. And um, so now let me put that in uh, the setup for how you would do a uh, Bayesian model in, in totality. Um, we're gonna look at the probability distribution of the parameters and we're gonna incorporate the prior uh, density for those parameters, which is what we know before we see any data. And we're also gonna take into account the likelihood of the observed data, which is the probability density of the observed data conditional on the parameters. And we could view this as, uh, you know, this pi x given theta, if we wanna use pi for our, our density. And what we really care about is the posterior density, which is pi of theta given x, which is the density of theta of the parameters conditional on the observed data and our uh, prior belief in theta. And with all that considered, we have this proportionality relationship of the posterior being proportional to the likelihood multiplied by the prior. Now that doesn't give us a distribution, but it gives us a good starting point. Uh, and kind of the agnostic way of approaching it is, um, you know, okay, we know that proportionality and, you know, let's pick an algorithm that picks some, uh, you know, potential draws from the distribution based on that proportionality relationship. And then from those draws, let's empirically determine what the distribution is. But that's a really open-ended question. How many draws do you have to do, et cetera? What algorithm should you do to get the best draws? And so that can be very computationally intensive. You'll get a good answer, but it's not necessarily pragmatic to go to that much trouble in every model. Now, we're lucky if we have a lot of data, you know, a lot of observed data X, then there are some approximations we can uh, where we're able to kind of like uh, take advantage of these asymptotic results, uh, which, you know, may, some of you were probably exposed to like learning maximum likelihood or something. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, as n goes to infinity, what happens to the sample mean? What happens to my maximum likelihood estimate? And the same sort of thing is happening with our posterior estimates as well. Um, so 
briefly, I'll talk about that, and then we'll get into some Python requirements. So you uh, do a Taylor approximation for the log posterior. You have this, and uh, this is your score function, and this is your Hessian function. So standard quadratic approximation just based on the first derivatives and the second derivatives. And uh, the approximation is going to get more accurate as we get more data, and that's going to move the posterior mode closer to theta. So this theta hat, the posterior mode, is going to move closer to theta. And by calculus, that means the score function, you know, the thing where we're, you know, at the maximum value, the derivative is going to be zero, that first derivative. So that score function is going to go to zero, and we're left with this relationship right here which is saying, you know, uh, that the posterior density is going to be proportional to a normal density. And so we're going to be able to get asymptotic multivariate normality with our posterior uh, distribution. Uh, and one more wrinkle, um, the parameters you care about, you might have them in like a certain, uh, a certain scale, like they're all positive, et cetera. But for optimization purposes, it can be very convenient to have it across the real line. So we have one extra step where we do a transformation. Uh, and so this is like our final approximation that we have here. Uh, we use the delta method in the approximation, so we just have this variance transform right here. So that's kind of the big picture. And now we're into Python. The Bayes map var package implements this uh, approximation for a Bayesian model that you've given. Uh, you know, you, uh, once it gets the model, uh, then it's going to be able to give you an estimate of the unconstrained parameters and the constrained parameters, their mode, and it's going to give you a posterior variance estimate for those parameters as well. So you're going to have all the pieces you need for looking at the posterior distribution and then answering questions about the parameters. So, and we'll get into in these individual pieces too, the Hessian and Delta and so forth. And right now, I've set it up so Bayes map bar works with a uh, dictionary of TensorFlow probability distributions and columns. Uh, there's no reason you can't extend it to be, uh, you know, some other models as well, like even SciPy and NumPy itself. Uh, you know, the distribution functions, we could set it up so it's going to take a dictionary of that information and then give you your results back. But, you know, we're starting with TensorFlow probability. It's a nice, uh, you know, framework where you can, you know, modularly build these Bayesian models. You know, I mentioned probabilistic programming language. That's kind of the buzzword for it. Uh, and it's built using TensorFlow as the engine underneath everything, so it's plenty fast. Um, and at the core, I mentioned the distribution object, and you know, probability distribution, okay, it's a normal, it's a gamma distribution, et cetera. You know, this is just how it's abstractly uh, modeling this distribution. And in a little bit, we'll see like uh, an object, you know, e examples of how it does that as well. And so it's gonna take all that stuff and give you a uh, complex Bayesian model. And we're going to, with this, with uh, parameter values that we're gonna get from that dictionary of tensors, uh, we're going to feed it into SciPy Optimize, and then we're gonna use limited memory, Broyden, Fletcher, Goldfarb, Shano, uh, to get a, uh, yeah, intimidating name, but it's a very nice, fast uh, optimization technique. Uh, and we're going to get uh, posterior mode estimates. And uh, that's going to be also based on the uh, auto diff results that TensorFlow is giving you as well, uh, particularly the math value and gradient function, which is up calling all the gradient tape underneath. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's giving you all you need to get your uh, posterior mode quicker. And um, let's see. Uh, one more thing with variance estimation, um, you know, all the details are in the proceedings paper, which I'll have a link to. Um, 
you know, we're using numeric derivatives. We could do it analytically as well, but it can be computational intensive sometimes as well. Um, and then, you know, once we've got the individual pieces, the delta method matrix, the Hessian, et cetera, it's just one computation to put it all together. So pretty straight. All right, so, you know, talked a little bit about the Python. Let's get into an example. Um, it's kind of for fun, uh, we're gonna use BARD, the uh, uh, large language model interface that Google has to get some uh, data. And then we're gonna set up a dictionary of distributions using that data in TensorFlow probability. Uh, and, you know, I can't put my, our retail data up here, uh, so we're gonna stick with a fun uh, example with just publicly available data that you know everybody can download and do on their own too. Um, so we talked with Bard to get the data, um, and we talked with ChatGPT to ask a little bit about uh, the priors that we might wanna use for the coefficients. You know, I'm not, I don't have great knowledge of, uh, you know, the movie industry or whatever, so, you know, maybe this is a little bit more illuminating. Uh, and again, let me, you know, hone in on the data. You know, we're trying to predict the best picture based on if the director won an Oscar previously and the number of movie stars in your picture. And uh, so we're asking about the priors for uh, previous Oscar win and number of movie stars, th those coefficients. And just kind of saying, okay, you know, normal with some, you know, standard deviation of one or two or whatever. Um, but we're going to, for the number of movie stars, we're going to make sure that's always greater than zero. That we're saying, okay, there's no negative effect of movie stars. And so that's what we've set up. Now let's look at the Collab Notebook. Yeah, so map estimation, posterior estimation. Uh, first, we're gonna install Bayes map bar using pip. Um, we can d walk through the requirements and stuff like that later. Um, but TensorFlow, uh, pandas, stuff like that. You know, pretty, pretty normal stuff. And we're getting the movies data. Um, Years a Slave, Amadeus, etc. Some good ones here. And then, um, you know, a little bit of feature engineering to make stuff Boolean, nothing too complicated. And then we're, uh, then we're starting to build our dictionary of distributions. Um, with the unconstrained parameters and the constrained parameters in it. Uh, so for uh, the director, uh, that's just gonna be, the, the coefficient for director is just gonna be normal, centered at zero, with a standard deviation of two. Uh, so we're using uh, the normal distribution class. And um, TensorFlow probability also has this uh, distribution called deterministic, which basically just takes something and gives you a transformation of it. So, um, I've got other ways that you can do the constraints and the uh, variable transformations, uh, but it's also simple to just put it through TensorFlow probability and use deterministic as well. So that's what we're gonna do in this example. And so that's for director. And then for stars, we're to make sure it's gonna be greater than zero, um, we're going to use a truncated normal. We're gonna center it, center it at like 0.5 and uh, we're going to say the lower bound is gonna be zero and the upper bound is gonna be infinity. Um, so it's still normal, but it's gonna be positive. And we're going to also take the log of it, so it's going to be over the entire real line in the unconstrained space. And then, so the, the transformation of it is we're just going to be exponentiating it to get the actual uh, coefficient. So that's that's our setup for our priors. Oh, one more thing. Um, we, we have an intercept too, which I'm just arbitrarily, okay, it's just normal. So it's, you know, you, you it's meaningless. The, the intercept is really not that meaningful for the model, but it's, 
you know, uh, kind of like one of the uh, mechanical pieces you need so that it works. So, um, and then you do that, and then we set up the likelihood of the observed data. So this, we're going to say, okay, it's a logistic regression uh, with our logit being, you know, just this linear form right here. Uh, stars times, uh, stars times the uh, data for stars, uh, director times the data for director. Uh, these being the coefficients and uh, the intercept parameter as well. So it's a callable that's taking in uh, the director, uh, stars, and intercept parameters. So pretty straightforward. Uh, and also I set the D-type as float 64. Uh, that's a little bit, so TensorFlow likes, likes to default to 32-bit, and that's probably great in, you know, deep learning cases, you know, the black box models. But when we're dealing with these, uh, you know, parametric models, we want as much precision as possible, so okay, let's go ahead and use float 64. So that's, you know, maybe something to be careful about. And so once you do that, you fit it into the map bar function, uh, which is taken the distribution dictionary and the observed data, which is our movies data set. And you're specifying the observed variable names uh, because in your observed data, you quite possibly could have stuff you don't want to model. Um, and you're just looking at the extract and you're not bothering to like throw out the other stuff. And so uh, also there's a little, uh, switch where you can skip variance estimation or keep doing it if you wanted to as well. And so with that, you know, we're getting the individual pieces. Uh, and so it's a little, let me go a little bit out of order because we, you know, you care about the parameter estimates, but you also care how your optimization, went, whether you're able to uh, reach your, your maximum or not. And so this scipy opt is uh, returned by base map bar as well. And so you can look at that to see if anything went wrong. And we see that, okay, we converged, everything's good. Um, we could look at it in more detail as well too, uh, specify the verbose option and stuff. But the important thing is we converged, everything is good, we should interpret things. Uh, you are, well, we can start interpreting things, and then if we need to do like some diagnostic checks or whatever, we can start doing that. Um, so with that in mind, you know, it gives us uh, estimates for the unconstrained parameters and the constrained parameters. And we see like the unconstrained, okay, stars is actually negative in the unconstrained space. Uh, but of course in the constrained space, uh, I'm sorry, yes, in the constrained space, it is positive like we want it. And so, you know, these are, uh, you know, unit change in the uh, log odds ratio. So, you know, not as blankly interpreted as a uh, linear regression model, but you can still get something out of it. And if you really wanted to, you could exponentiate it to get the effect on the odds ratio itself, holding the covariance constant. And so, uh, and we also get the individual pieces for variance. Uh, the Hessian, if you wanted to look at the unconstrained variance, is basically uh, inverting that to get that. And uh, the delta matrix that we're using for our transformation. And finally, the variance matrix, uh, which we could use uh, you know, to make confidence intervals, et cetera, because it's all multivariate normal, all easy to interpret. So, um, so that's kind of our nice example. And we're just about done. Yeah, and I, I, in the paper, I did a simulation as well, um, you know, using some nice uh, uh, sci-fi stuff that was very helpful. Anderson-Darling test. Uh, ba basically, we're testing the asymptotic normality based on our posterior, mo our, uh, based on our estimates from the map, uh, from Bayes' map bar. So standardizing using those estimates, is it normal like we expect it to be? And we did find that, yes, it was normal using Anderson Darling and checking uh, the rejection rate in our, uh, you know, the, the rejection rate for Anderson Darling, that 0.05 is in the irreversible, et cetera. 
Uh, we also use stats models there for doing that check as well. So, so that's those. That's a big idea of Bayes map bar. Um, here are some references, and um, I've got a GitHub up for it. Um, you know, hopefully get some more examples, etc. Uh, and the paper proceedings uh, is right now on this. I think it would be later move to like a more stable place as well, but I'll put that up on the GitHub, uh, GitHub as well. Um, and of course it's most importantly in PIP, so you can just download and use it as you like. So. Thank you, Charles. Questions for Charles? Hey, Charles. Hey. Thank you for your talk. Um, I know it, it wasn't really applicable uh, for your example, but mm -hmm. using this library, is it easy to generate posterior predictive samples? Yes, I've actually got a, um, I've got an option where you can do that in, uh, in uh, one of the uh, sub functions. I'll, I'll make sure that that's documented as well. Uh, you just call it, uh, it's literally just gonna be postpred is a, is a string uh, that you can pass into one not the uh, map bar function itself, but one of the auxiliary functions. And that might be something I could work into like a specific, uh, you know, a specific subcommand or something as well. And one other quick question. Mm -hmm. When you spoke earlier about being able to compute that the variance parameters analytically, is that yeah. using like a, a variational inference approach? Well, no. Um, so the auto diff could conceivably be used for uh, th this, this uh, math uh, value gradient I showed. Um, let me go back there. Uh, conceivably, you could just call that basically twice, uh, but that wouldn't be like super efficient. Sure. Uh, they're, they're estimating Hessian isn't like an, you know, an e super easy problem in machine learning. Uh, you know, so right now we're using the scores or analytic and we're just taking numeric derivatives of that to get the Hessian. But conceivably, you could just take the math value of gradient of the math value of gradient, basically, one by one, and then build up your Hessian matrix that way. Uh, but it's not, it's not going to be trivial computation. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I'm a big fan of the limited memory uh, BFGS oh, yeah. uh, bounded method. Yeah. It's a really good uh, piece of code, but many people in the deep learning community yeah. have criticized it for yielding uh, poor performance against non-convex problems, mm -hmm. and their training problems are yeah. all super yeah. non-convex. Yeah. So uh, d do you have a sort of a... a Push back against this, or are you mostly interested in problems that are mostly convex? I would think we would mostly be interested in problems that are convex. That's not to say the other cases are not relevant, but you know, a, a large, um, you know, the the, you know, I wrote out the uh, yeah this stuff. There are a lot of regularity conditions that need to be met for that to be valid in the first place. And I would imagine the non-convex, well, this to be valid, but then like, you know, the maximum and stuff working well. Um, just like in maximum likelihood theory, we have to have, okay, it's this nice open set, you know, your parameters are continuous, et cetera. So in those cases, you're gonna have well-defined second derivatives, everything. So it's gonna be fairly convex. But those other cases are very valid. And like if you, you know, if you have like some algorithm that is able to handle them and also can give you your Hessian that you'd use for the variance computation, then that, 
that's awesome. So. I have a follow-up question. Uh -huh. uh, you, <clears throat> earlier you uh, positioned the uh, Bayesian modeling as a, um, a sort of criticism of good old-fashioned L2 regularization, which one can interpret as a particular case uh, of Bayesian, uh, Bayesian modeling. But in that particular yeah. case, the penalty term for the regularization is typically typically carries a um, weight that has to be hand tweaked because the regularization terms tends to draw the solution away from yeah. data adequation from yeah, yeah. your well, other model. But also with Bayesian, you're very hand tweaking as well because you've got you're thinking you know, you're thinking up there your hyperparameters that you'd have for your actual uh, fires and so forth. So there's a lot of, yeah. But I, that, that's a very good point that the L2 is kind of a subset of this as well. It's just, you know, kind of a generic subset. Uh, so, yeah, because particularly in the, like the models we've dealt with, you know, with so many different layers and so, because I, uh, so at Revionics, we're working in price optimization and stuff like that. So there are a whole bunch of different pieces in our model parameters that are having different, you know, pretty different effects. So, um, you know, the flexibility of a Bayesian model and then getting these different types of uh, regularization penalties into the model has been very helpful. So. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question, if you guys have any questions. If not, we will thank Charles again. Thank you so much for this yeah. great talk. Thank you all. This was very fun.